नीलम स्टार्ट यस यस गौरव सर रिक्वेस्ट है सर टू स्टार्ट लाइव कर दो ओके वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल ऑफ यू आई नीलम शबिना मुर्मू असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जूलॉजी दिस ऑनलाइन वेबिनार प्लेटफॉर्म दिस इज अ वेबिनार फ्रॉम आवर कॉलेज and now or today we are in a topic corona pandemic searching hope and responsibility now what is pandemic we can say that it is a type of epidemic which spread to different types of so which spread to different countries the difference between epidemic and pandemic is very easy to remember actually we have to remember the word p which means passport that is and pan nilam you are not audible nilam yes yes nilam is not audible nilam are you there this network problem i think network problem achha nil nilam you are you are on unmute you, you are on mute so unmute it okay am i audible now yes yes, yes. Audible. Am, I audible? am i audible now yes, yes, yes you are yes, audible yes. okay <coughs> so all of you know that today we are here for the webinar entitled corona pandemic searching hope and responsibilities the outbreak of corona is very special to all of us it is part of pandemic of mental illness is emerging all over the world negative thoughts has encircle us from negative thoughts has encircle us from all our mind is now full of depression anxiety fear and many different types of questions arise in our mind in this pandemic situation are the human race the more powerful race of the earth are going to extinct are the people suffering from very common diseases like diabetes are prone to these diseases are we going for or going to or heading to mass extinction to get answer of all these questions we have two known or two renowned speakers from different background now the main solution from all of this that we can only hope, the we can only hope that our doctors or scientists will develop a vaccine and we will get back to our normal life till then we have to be very responsible or we have many responsibilities so that we can coexist with the sars cov now without taking too much time i would like to request our responsible sir to say something about this webinar we will thank you sir allow sir sir our vice principal sandeep kumar ghatak Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon, all of you. At the outset, uh, I welcome all the daily honourables, participants, my colleagues, and more particularly, most honourable and respected resource persons to this webinar, annual webinar, a international webinar, Corona pandemic, searching for and responsibility. As all of you know. human presently human civilization is passing to an acute crisis crisis of our existence so earlier we have faced numerous attacks from the virus but present virus has a very peculiar character it not only affects one person when it affects one person when it attacks one person simultaneously simultaneously it also affects others and more particularly all of its family members and there is a possibility to to damage the a particular happy family 
naturally the pertinent question which makes a severe blow to our thought that whether human being perish from this earth more particularly when at the time of massive scientific development now we but now we have a hope hope for survival through the discharge of our responsibilities i think it is my personal perception that to combat this uh, pandemic all of us not that all individuals personally each and every individual must have some responsibilities if we carefully discharge our responsibilities then we can ahead with a good hope hope for our uh, very uh, signing future and signing existence thank you and uh, i also extend my gratitude and thanks to all these persons who give us the available times today with us and they enlightened us uh, regarding this issue and we act accordingly without wasting time i hand it over to nilam to thank you i would request our head of the department dr supriya roy to introduce our speaker thank you very much professor nilam it's my great privilege and immense pleasure to be a member of this webinar i feel myself lucky enough to be a family member of zoology department of asansol girls college i do strongly believe that the webinar was in uh, impossible without the blessing of our three trio milidi madhuri ji and kashinath sir on behalf of myself and on behalf of zoology department asansol girls college i am indebted to our vice principal sir dr shondeep kumar ghatak iqac coordinator dr shamol sheth our valuable speakers and all the crew members of asansol girls college for making this webinar possible especially i am indebted to professor biru rajo and professor subhashish ghosh within a short time i will invite our first speaker dr rakesh kundu assistant professor in zoology vishwabharati shantiniketan although he is working in many fields but his specialty is mainly islets biology he has published many research articles in reputed natural national and international journal he is natural at the state by us i am talking about his publications in world renowned journal nature with this few words i would like to invite our first speaker dr rakesh kundu dr lak dr kundu please enlighten ourselves dr kundu please thank you thank you thank you all and namaskar uh, to shupriyo samudhi uh, and nilam for arranging this and uh, inviting me in this uh, webinar and i thank uh, i should be thankful to your team also who have uh, <clears throat> working uh, with this principal university staff so i have actually working uh, in the bishop bharti since 2004 under professor sabir bhattacharya who is a renowned diabetes and endocrinologist so throughout this year 16 years we have uh, actually exposed with the diabetes and uh, we have seen that the running pandemic is uh, really created a grave situation all over the world at least 8 million people are suffering today at least 4 million are suffering 8 million cases are there in india also there are uh, thus uh, the cases are reaching just 4 lakhs around that 
and uh, there are uh, more than 2000 deaths so we are running in a pandemic situation very grave and uh, alarming so we don't know the coming days what are waiting for us but we are expecting for heart immunity and uh, the records are showing that uh, the data the data actually showing uh, we have already have uh, high heart immunity in india so that the death rate has been already minimized in india so without wasting my time i i want to start my lecture <coughs> so the title of my uh, just a minute just a minute so this is the title of my lecture nexus of covid-19 and diabetes pandemics so in this lecture i will uh, talk about the recent covid-19 cases how it came to uh, how it actually infected the human beings how it came from the other animals and uh, how it spread through the world and uh, how it actually infect the human beings and what is the relationship of this uh, covid-19 with the diabetic patients diabetic subjects so we are actually specially dealing with the diabetic subjects only okay i am not a specialist of uh, virus i am not a virologist so let's see <clears throat> so uh, the coronaviruses the coronavirus is a large group of virus common among many animals including humans they can cause uh, respiratory illness in humans and gastrointestinal tract in animals under the electron microscope virion scopes have large peplomers that make it uh, look like crown okay crown like structure so that the name corona meaning a crown or a halo around this and before 2003 human corpses were not considered as deadly virus uh, the circulating strains were causing mild symptoms uh, in immuno competent people typically coronavirus symptoms included runny nose cough sore throat headache fever you all know now <clears throat> because every day you can uh, you are watching tv news and already uh, <clears throat> whatsapp what some messages also coming on this topic so you are quite updated i hope so and uh, typically the coronavirus symptoms include the fever in immunocompromised patients such as diabetic subjects such as the cardiovascular disease the patients who are suffering from this uh, illness in parallel they have a chance to grow a kind of pneumonia bronchitis uh, <clears throat> they can deteriorate further which lead to mortality <clears throat> so this is the uh, the first pandemic of 21st century severe acute respiratory syndrome Uh, that is known as SARS-CoV mm -hmm. emerged in China, resulting in deaths. So this is the history of the, the virus, <clears throat> and more than eight thousand patients managed to let a strain of evolve in Saudi Arabia also. That is known as Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus (MERS-CoV). Approximately two thousand five hundred cases have been confirmed, including eight sixty-one deaths, uh, with a fearful case of fatality. rate of 34.4% so this is uh, uh, some history of the coronaviruses <clears throat> and before december 2019 six common coronaviruses were known to infect humans and later on uh, this coronavirus this is a new coronavirus which has uh, known as covid-19 so this coronavirus emerged and uh, make this group to as uh, seven so cobs are genetic pathogens originating in animals and can be transmitted to humans through direct contact all cobs that cause epidemics <clears throat> all cobs that cause epidemics actually are believed to be originated in bats bats are host for many coronaviruses however in most cases these viruses were transmitted to humans through an intermediate animal host sarscov started through direct contact with the market civet cats okay during that 2003 sars 
and uh, mars cov transmitted directly to humans from dromedary camels you can see this you can see this uh, this is civet cat this is dromedary camels and uh, these are the historical uh, outbreaks of sars and mars and now we have seen that the covid 19 is suspected to be emerged in the seafood market in wuhan china we all know that and uh, most of the early reported cases have been in that market which has which was closed later by the chinese authority evolutionary the analysis of covid 19 virus revealed that it is most similar to the bat sars like coronaviruses and for this similarity it was named as sars cov2 so <clears throat> In summary, most of the scientific reports believe that SARS-CoV-2 was originated in bats and transmitted to humans through an intermediate animal host uh, from the sea food market of China. But that intermediate host uh, has not been identified till date. But it is believed that uh, it may be the pangolins. So pangolins are uh, found in the South Asian countries available. Okay, so. Let's see the epidemiology of the virus. So you you already know this the sequence of events which took place one after another. So on December thirty one the two zero one one nine the Wuhan Municipal Health Committee actually first reported a cluster of twenty seven pneumonia like cases of unknown etiology, including seven severe cases with a common reported like. To the Hunan seafood wholesale market in the Wuhan. Later, a new strain of coronavirus was isolated from these patients, differing from SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, and uh, with some sequence similarity. This virus was temporarily named as 2019 NCoV uh, by WHO, and then officially named as SARS-CoV-2. As we know, uh, that that SARS-CoV-2 actually named by the International Committee of Taxon for viruses. Although important epidemiological risk include a history of travel from Wuhan and close contact with a patient with COVID-19, and in the 14 days of 14 days before symptoms onset, recent studies argue that Hunan seafood market may not be the only source. So this is debated till date. Okay, the, uh, what is the origin of this uh, virus and? Uh, the people also trace the patient zero, but not yet uh, identified. <clears throat> the main transmission route of SARS-CoV-2 from person to person is respiratory droplets or contact. Other possible routes include aerosol, oral fecal transmission, and certain groups of population, especially elderly men and those with underlying diseases, are more susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection. So it was like. Uh, so it is just the patients or subjects who are actually suffering uh, with the comorbidity. Like uh, as I've said, immunos those are using immunosuppressive drugs or some have organ transplant, some are suffering from chronic diabetes, some are from cardiovascular diseases. So they are the vulnerable subjects uh, for the SARS-CoV-2 and how they're vulnerable, I will discuss in my uh, consequent slides. And children, infants, and pregnant women are also reported to have SARS-CoV-2 infection. So more recently, two studies showed that uh, mean incubation period of the virus is three days. However, it ranges from zero to 24 days, but the mean incubation is uh, like three days. And some other studies shows that it is uh, almost five days. And uh, this survey actually discovered <coughs> that 1.18% of the uh, experienced a direct contact with the wildlife uh, food habit okay one point just 1.18 percent of the uh, person who are actually infected so this revealed the complex epidemiology of this outbreak and uh, as of now as i've said that uh, almost 8 million uh, cases and we just put global public health into a high alert so, as I've said that it has been uh, proposed that wild animals such as civets and camels are the intermediate host for SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 and MERS-CoV, uh, the intermediate host for this coronavirus, novel coronavirus has not yet been identified, but the analysis of the samples obtained from 
Malayan pangolins. As I've said, the pangolins may be consider, uh, are considered to be the intermediate host. So, in an anti-smuggling operation from China, it has been, uh, it has been uh, found that the potential intermediate host may be the may be the pangolin, and they have 85 to 92 percent nucleotide sequence uh, identity with the SARS-CoV-2 genome. And more recently, SARS-CoV-2 has been found in uh, to infect cats, ferrets, and tigers. Also, you have the uh, you have seen that in newspaper reports and uh, in news channels, in WhatsApp messages. Also, those videos are coming up that uh, some animals are also get got infected with this COP2 uh, from uh, some zoo worker. Okay. So the workers in the zoo may infected with this co coronavirus and uh, this spreads among the, the mammals. So how this spread among the mammals, I will discuss in my consequent subsequent slides. You can see uh, what is the relationship and how it enters into the host. So this is the sequence. This is the nucleotide sequence of the coronavirus. A genome structure and I will discuss the its life cycle also. So this COP genome is a single stranded positive stents RNA plus plus SS RNA we say and the genome size ranges from 27 to 32 kilo base pair one of the largest known RNA virus okay. So students who are actually listening to this lecture please note down these things and if you have some question you can uh, you can blog in the general you can give your message so that the host can uh, <coughs> put up those questions to me okay so please uh, supriyo and uh, nilam please track on the questions also the genomic structure of cobs contains at least six open reading frames as you can see uh, the two open reading frames are uh, very large and those open reading frames actually gives rise to the two proteins, two large proteins, PP1A and PP1B. So you just see ORF1A and ORF1B, the big structure. And further, you just see here that the, the that is the, those ORFs are situated in the five prime region and other ORFs which are located in the three prime encodes at least uh, four structural proteins. You remember, please envelop glycoprotein spike protein S, responsible for recognizing host cell receptor, membrane proteins M, responsible for shaping the virion. So I am, so please concentrate in this. So there are spike proteins, there are, there are membrane proteins, there are envelope proteins responsible for virion assembly, and uh, there are other N, N for nucleocapsid proteins, which are similar like our histones for packaging of the RNA into the viral viral virus. Okay. And this uh, play roles in pathogenicity as an interferon inhibitor also, this, uh, this N, N protein. So this is the overall uh, genome structure of the virus. And you can see the virus assembled, uh, assembled virus, a corona-like cell. And inside this, uh, this is the RNA with this nucleocapsid B down string model. And you can see the spike proteins. These spike proteins are very important. These spike proteins are actually <clears throat> doing this, that's, uh, that uh, attachment binding and, uh, and uh, insertion of the RNA. These uh, polyproteins, I'm moving to the next slide. You just see here, uh, this is the uh, the life cycle of the virus inside the host cell. And the host cell is basically the respiratory alveolar cell, alveolar type, type 2 alveolar cells. These are basically affected by the coronavirus uh, in the bronchias, bronchial epithelial cell. So <clears throat> where it binds to the surface receptor angiotensin converting enzyme 2, SE2. So you can see, you can concentrate here. So this is the binding site for the coronavirus. And uh, through this S glycoprotein found on its surface, it actually binds with the AC2 on the host. So this is the 
this is the S protein, viral S protein, which is clipped into two parts. One is S1, another is S2. And this S1 actually determines the host range and cellular tropes of facilitated viral attachment to the target cell. S2, just a minute, please wait. Okay, this is S2. S2 is a unit that mediates fusion of the virals with the cellular membranes and ensuring viral entry to the endocytosis. So these two, uh, SE2 and uh, these TMPR SE2 receptors are there, which are actually helping the virus to get inside the alveolar cell, which is situated in the lungs, lungs epithelium. The affinity between the virus surface proteins and its receptor is a critical step for viral entry. And understanding of this mechanism may provide uh, some therapeutic, uh, may provide some insight for uh, generating some therapeutic targets. Okay. A recent uh, study showed that the affinity between the S glycoprotein of SARS CoV 2 and SE2 binding efficiency is 10 to 20 fold higher than the SARS CoV the, that is previously reported. So it is uh, just 10 to 20 fold higher than the SARS, SARS CoV. Okay, and uh, which could explain the highly infectious ability of the SARS-CoV-2. So it is highly infectious. So a lower viral load may infect a patient, may turn into violent outbreak inside the body of a patient who are immunocompromised and may lead to uh, grip, uh, may lead to uh, death. So let us uh, see how, what is uh, the virus is doing inside the cell. Okay, how it is replicating inside the cell and how it packaged and, uh, and then uh, how it actually comes out from the cell and uh, even uh, and, uh, and doing some immunological consequences. Okay, so let's see here. The S glycoprotein of the virus bind to the cellular receptor converting uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, AC2, and enters the target cell through an endosomal pathway. You can see this endosomal pathway. So it is the membrane actually invaginate to take up the virus upon binding with the receptors and following the entry of the virus to the host cell, the mRNA, viral mRNA actually unveiled, released through the cytoplasm. And those, uh, those genes for ORF1A and ORF1B is translated to polyproteins which are clipped by the protease to form uh, a replication transcription complex. So this is the replication transcription complex. So at least 16 proteins are actually synthesized. And these proteins help the virus to replicate inside the host cell. So upon entry into the host cell, the virus actually hijacked the whole host cell machinery. Okay. So this RTC complex then binds with the, with the positive strand of the RNA of the virus and replicate. So you can see this fourth cell transcription of full length strand by replication complex to generate a minus strand. And that this minus strand is further uh, actually uh, helps to replicate the actual RNA of the virus. And also there are fragmented transcription. So for student, you are not aware of these terms there is a uh, interrupted or fragmented transcription of the virus virus genome which leads to the synthesis of so many structural non structural accessory proteins okay which are necessary for viral packaging uh, virulence etc <clears throat> so the as i have said so upon entry into the host cell the the virus actually transcribed, translated, replicated, and those proteins which are synthesized MES, as I've said, that membrane protein, envelope protein, and spike proteins, which are uh, synthesized on the come on the endoplasmic reticulum, then glycosylated in the Golgi complex, and then packaged into the endosomal vesicle and then released. So as, as long as the viral loads actually released, there are immune cells which react with this load and uh, there is a huge immune 
uh, response from the body that leads to actually the the bad consequences so we'll see what are the consequences of this virus uh, so as i have uh, said that the virus actually get enter into this uh, the the alveolar cell of the lungs through this ac2 receptor so ac2 receptor what is the normal function of ac2 receptor ac2 receptor is in the renin angiotensin pathway and uh, this pathway actually controls the vasodilation vaso control uh, vaso constriction this mechanism so there is a increase and decrease of blood pressure with due to this pathway and there are vaso pressure there is aldosterone secretion uh, from uh, hypothalamus and adrenal which leads to actually sodium and water reabsorption so this is the normal function of the of the this receptor ac2 receptor and uh, angiotensin in our body but uh, the virus actually took this receptor as as a gateway to enter into the alveolar cell so this slide is actually just a can storm the il1 beta il1 il receptor il7 il8 il9 so lots of interleukins that is secreted in the vicinity of the of the infection site uh, the tnf alpha so these are actually cytokines for students if you uh, if you go through the immunology book you can understand these things so the the this is the infection immunity part actually so this infection of the covid actually uh, guarded by the cytokines release by our body so there is a war there is a war between the between the pathogen and the and the body okay and that leads to actually and the autopsy of the patients actually re revealed that alveoli were filled with fluid white blood cells mucus and damaged lung cell debris and there is no doubt the lung is the most severely injured organ of the sars cov 2 besides it injure it it actually injures heart liver kidney brain and intestine and pancreas too okay so these are the consequence in the lungs and also it causes some uh, cardiological disorder cardiological cardiac uh, ischemia uh, then the blood clot inside the blood vessel that leads to the organ injury or multi organ failure in severe consequences and covid this is what is the covid 19 the relationship of the covid 19 with the diabetes so diabetes is a is a uh, there are uh, immunological expression lots of immunological expression is there in the in the diabetic subjects and they are actually immun immunocompromised state the obese and diabetic subjects actually suffer from the immunocompromised state so already the disease is in advanced stage and covid 19 infection leads to the grave consequences so hypertension diabetes coronary artery disease coronary artery disease cardiovascular disease these are the main association of the severity and mortality rate of the infected patients so <clears throat> a larger study in uh, during uh, january i think a larger study during the January, this paper actually revealed that 72,000 patients with COVID-19 in China indicated that patients with diabetes has a threefold higher mortality rate compared with the mortality rate of COVID-19 in healthy patients. So, always there is a uh, high chance with the diabetic patients. So, diabetic patients should uh, should be should actually uh, take care of themselves so that they do not get contact with the With the COVID-19 subjects, in Italy also the same thing has been reported, and it is found that 35 percent of the diabetic subjects have the higher mortality, uh, with 30 percent have ischemic heart diseases. So diabetic subjects had to check for the disease, so that, and this is the angiotensin system, how it affects the the diabetic subjects and uh, i should say that uh, this uh, ac2 receptors is found in the lungs as well as in the pancreas also and we don't know whether in pancreas 
in pancreatic beta cells this uh, this virus is also affect this binds with the ac ac2 receptor and injure the beta cells or not but definitely there is a upsurge of the uh, glucose level there is a hyperglycemia state in the patients with the the normal and the diabetic patient there is a high level of the glucose and deficiency of insulin has been reported and the sars cov just a minute sars cov was shown to bind to ac2 in the pancreatic islet as i've said and possibly contributing to the excessive mortality rate of the patient due to hyperglycemia so there is a high sugar level in the in the blood ac1 and angiotensin 2 receptor blockers also up regulate ac2 expression and as well as the ac2 expression uh, is high so there is a there this facilitated the infection more in root ac2 is the root by which it can infect the lung cells so ac2 gene polymorphism has been also linked to the increased risk of the uh, increased risk in the diabetic patients such diabetic subjects by contrast up regulated ac2 may increase the levels of angiotensin mounting an anti inflammatory effect so there is a so there is a contrasting studies are there so the diabetic subjects which are using ac1 and angiotensin blockers uh, should stop using these things because there is a contradictory findings so these are the the things the covid 19 the diabetic subjects should uh, follow uh, they should continue with the diabetic anti diabetic drugs maybe metformin or other drugs uh, which they are using with uh, the clinical uh, regular monitoring of the blood glucose level also should they follow and type 1 diabetes as you know for the students i am telling that diabetes is uh, like type 1 type 2 diabetes is there type 1 diabetes there is a lack of insulin so in that case there is a decrease in the in the insulin level there is an increase in the in the keto acidosis in the ketone level of the affected subject so so the regular monitoring of the ketone body is also necessary in the infected patients with type 1 diabetes so these are the uh, drugs which the type 2 diabetic patients actually use to reduce their blood sugar level metformin is uh, very much known to all of you i think and uh, if it infect in infected patient the risk of lactic acidosis due to hypoxia in the lungs is there so use of metformin should be stopped in the case of diabetic subjects with the infection covid infection sgl2 inhibitors also should stop because it uh, it actually dehydrate the things you glycemia ketoacidosis may result glp1 or receptor uh, also stop dp4 inhibitors are safe drugs dp4 inhibitors dp4 is a in the circulatory enzyme so dp4 uh, dp4 inhibitors may increase the uh, insulin level and the safe drugs the safest drug for the diabetic subject is insulin injecting insulin that requires frequent monitoring due to risk of hyper hypoglycemia if you take excess insulin that leads to hypoglycemia and that uh, that leads to shock of the patient and the patient may die due to this hypoglycemic shock so a special care for the diabetic subjects should be necessary while considering the therapeutics okay and ac1 arbs those blocker ac1 uh, ac ac inhibitors which are uh, frequently used for the diabetic subjects and for the corona viruses for diabetic subjects uh, continue use unless a specific contradiction arises so chloroquine hydroxychloroquine uh, you know that these uh, these drugs are actually recommended for the the corona virus cases but they are also known as the insulin secretagogues just to it some okay 
the chloroquine actually may lead to hypoglycemia and uh, caution in people with comorbid cases of the disease. So chloroquine is not recommended for the diabetic subjects. Lupinavir, ritonavir are some antiviral drugs which are also hyperglycemic. Deterioration of the glycemic control is there. So you should know that uh, I should say that huge amount of glucose means the hyperglycemia actually leads to the immunosuppression and that immunosuppression may be uh, hazardous for the COVID-19 patients. Then the glucocorticoids drugs also leads to hyperglycemia, remdesivir, hypnotoxicity, caution strains, pre-existing fatty liver disease also, uh, these are not recommended, these type of, these antiviral drugs. So unless and until the, the vaccine, true vaccine for this, this virus is coming, so it is the situation with the treatment uh, with other drugs are actually uh, under medical consideration. So these are the sites where these drugs are actually working with. The chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine increase the pH of the endosomes where the virus actually uh, taking the path route for the entry and exit. So this chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine actually interfere with the entry and exit of the virus. For the healthy subject, these are recommended, no problem. Lopinavir, ritonavir are antiviral drugs. These are also the viral replication and some other drugs also. Some monoclonal antibodies are also generated. And recently you have heard about the plasma therapy, uh, which are the affected person are giving, the affected person which are, are recovered from the COVID-19 uh, disease. Uh, they have high pool of antibodies. So this high pool of antibody can be a kind of the drug, a vaccine for the patient, infected patients, which are in the ICU. So I have also prepared a slide for this plasma therapy. So how does it work? As people fight the COVID-19 virus, they produce antibodies that attack the virus. And these antibodies are actually uh, secreted by the immune cells, B cells and uh, found in plasma in huge quantity affected person. So when they, the person is recovered, the pool of antibodies may uh, behave as a vaccine. Uh, you just see here how many patients can be treated. So one person donation plasma can be treated in two people. And scientists say that a patient need only one transfusion to get enough antibodies to fight the virus. So as the antibodies uh, have injected the viral load, it has been seen that the viral load has been decreases. So these are some, these are some uh, key points for the diabetic subjects. So people with diabetes developing COVID-19 are at high risk and they should uh, they should uh, control the infection control measures are in the community, such as lockdown, self isolation, quarantine. So these are recommended for the diabetic patients. And general precautions for the COVID-19 infection are critical for the diabetic subjects and their families. Patients with multiple comorbidities need extra care, extra caution. And continuation of good dietary practice, safe physical activities, regular glucose monitoring should be encouraged in the diabetic subjects and measures such as telemedicine is uh, for drug dispensing is extended duration for home delivery should be adopted. People with diabetes who develop COVID-19 should continue their routine medication. And for severe COVID-19 in diabetes patients, glycemic control is best achieved uh, with insulin. As I have said that uh, other uh, in terms of other diabetic drugs, insulin is the safest drug to be used. SE inhibitors, ARB should be continued unless your doctor tell you to stop it. Okay. And individualized decisions should be taken on continuing aspirin statins. Those are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So as there is a huge inflammation, so the patient can use aspirin statins 
on their own risk and research into pharmacological therapies for the treatment and prevention of COVID-19 people with diabetes is urgently needed. So this is all from my lecture. So I want the host. Okay, so. I want the host to take some questions, if any, from the students and the other teachers. Okay, uh, so Biru, will you please uh, uh, take the screen away? Is it possible? Question, question answer session will be conducted, I think, uh, after the second speaker, no? Yes, 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 yes. After, yes. after the second okay. speaker. We are collecting questions, okay, sir. Okay. After Sumitha, ma'am, so, uh, the question and answer session will be conducted. No problem, no problem, no problem. Okay, okay so sir. Thank you, sir, thank you. Sir. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Kundu, for your nice presentation. And as you have mentioned that uh, to ask few questions, not few, there are many questions in the comment box, but uh, as our customs is that, that after the end of the session, we will continue for the questions. So I would like to invite now one of our faculty members, our uh, Professor Sravuni Burun, to kindly take this online platform. Professor Burun, please. Okay, thank you, Supriyo. Am I audible and visible? Yes, yes ma'am. Good afternoon once again to all of you. Feeling very glad to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sumedha Roy. Formerly, she worked as an assistant professor in geology in the University of Badawan for 12 years. Recently, she is working as a postdoctoral research scientist in the Department of Biomolecular Medicine at Ghent University, Belgium. She has 37 international research publications in That's reputed right. journal till now. She has won five awards in different fields of her career. She is currently exploring different mutations in human RNF216, which lead to a rare recessive neurodegenerative disease. That's a short introduction about her right now. She is from Brussels, Belgium. I welcome you on behalf of Asansol Girls College. I would like to request Dr. Roy to start your presentation on our online platform. I request also our technical person to help her, our honorable speaker to share her screen. Dr. Roy, please. Thank you, Shrabuni. Am I audible, I think? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Perfect, Thank you, the organizers, for giving me this opportunity to share some of my views on this COVID-19, though I must confess that I'm not a virologist, nor am I working with immunology. It's sheer love of Shraboni because she happens to be a friend of mine from long back from my college days. So, so it's only love and affection from the organizers that have actually forced me to join this webinar. And I will not be talking about science because Rakesh has talked about really good science in COVID, but uh, maybe I'll be uh, presenting before you a very popular kind of lecture. And um, so I start by, but once again, I must thank the organizers of this uh, Asansol Girls College for making this platform so nicely it is being conducted this webinar and I hope to receive some comments and mis um, uh, questions also from the students. I'll be very glad to answer them. If you want to directly contact me, I'll be giving the mail ID and all that also is available. Uh, but now I start with sharing my screen. Uh, since it's about our responsibilities in the aftermath of Corona crisis. So I'll be talking more on the responsibilities that we as uh, scientists, we as social being uh, have in this uh, time of crisis. It, yes, uh, rightly it has been said, what is pandemic? Pandemic is a severe uh, situation that our world is going through now. So to start with, I believe there are a few responsibilities that we should be um, concerned about. Firstly, it is we should increase the scientific knowledge about the infection and transmission of COVID-19. 
so as responsible citizens, we should be knowing truly what and how this virus is doing with us and how we are getting infected and how we are responsible for transmission of the disease. Next, we need to minimize the process of man-to-man -man transmission. And that is the vital um, step that we all uh, can actually participate in just to reduce or to minimize the type of transmission. Next, we should show solidarity with any and all human being at this time of crisis. I'll be detailing about it. How, what do we mean by solidarity? How we can show the solidarity? And next, I think that we should prepare to fight the mental agony and the mental um, uh, distress that we are going through, maybe due to this confinement, due to this loneliness. Some people are having a very bore a lifestyle and that is how we should fight this mental agony and next to share positive thoughts and positive views uh, on the social media and uh, we should also share rationally what, what is correct the right information in the social media if possible so as scientists we do have some responsibilities at the people who are practicing science who are the responsible citizens we should be having and we should be fulfilling these responsibilities hope i am audible shabuni yes you are audible okay yes. thank you yes oh i proceed so uh, what is a coronavirus is it a monster from the pages of science fiction no it is uh, the virus that uh, Dr. Rakesh Kundu has nicely described it before you. And uh, just that it is from the family Coronaviridae. I'm again uh, saying it, reiterating the scientific uh, thoughts or scientific uh, information that has been shared by Rakesh already. Just for the students, once again, it is a beta coronavirus and it is the same type of coronavirus that is the COVID-19 causing uh, coronavirus that is the SARS-CoV-2 is the same coronavirus. It's more or less very similar to the other coronavirus that has been reported to cause SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome and the MARS, the Middle East respiratory syndrome. They are very, very close to that, but there lies certain subtle differences, very minute changes in this coronavirus uh, COV-2, which has made it more and more. That is, Rakesh has already told it, it is more than 10 to 20 fold higher in its affinity in the uh, this SARS-CoV-2. It shows um, a 10 fold or 20 fold rise in the affinity towards in, uh, the human or host cell. Uh, so how, what makes it more um, affectionate to the host cell? So to know about the virus in a little bit detail, let's get into it. So what is the thing? We have already known that uh, the coronavirus, the SCOV-2, that is the caus causative agent of COVID-19, uh, do possess RNA as a genetic material. And this RNA is a single-stranded genetic material. It's a sense single-stranded DNA, which is actually enabling it in the production of other elements of the virus. So this RNA is actually the key model or the key element, which is actually responsible for making the other elements of the virus possible. Now the nucleoproteins. So other than the RNA, there are certain proteins which are uh, which remain bound to the RNA. Those are the nucleoproteins that give the virus its structure. The virus attains its structure because of the presence of the nucleoproteins. Now comes the, uh, other than this uh, RNA and the nucleoprotein is the viral envelope. The viral envelope is actually the waxy barrier, which is um, covering the virus. And this viral envelope is the one which is responsible for um, keeping the virus safe outside the host cell. So when it is in the aerosol, when it is in the air, it is safe just because it has the viral envelope in it. So somehow if we can destroy the viral envelope, we would be um, possibly uh, killing the virus. Now uh, comes uh, the other element, which is 
the enveloped protein. It has also been talked about by Rakesh very well. So there are some enveloped proteins which are embedded in the viral envelope. And this, uh, these enveloped proteins are basically uh, required or they are responsible for the assembly of new viral particles. So if at all the virus infects the host cell, it has to reassemble itself again to produce the same structure within the host cell. That is brought about by the enveloped protein. And lastly, the spike protein. Uh, I think it's a very, very vital protein that this coronavirus possesses. This spike protein is actually giving the name corona because of the spike-like projections. It gives a crown-like appearance from where the name comes corona. And uh, it is actually the grappling hook uh, like structures, I mean, it, it uh, binds to the host cell in such a way that it holds onto it and then it tears open the spike protein to insert the RNA or the genetic material inside the host. So this is how the infection is brought about by the several components of the virus. Now, the infection as a process, because I told you that as uh, the practicing biologist, we should be knowing about the infection process. But I think Rakesh has already detailed the um, infection process so well, but I'll just round it up in a very short way to make it a little bit easier for the non-zoologists who are in the platform and uh, to make it a little bit clear. It's, I've talked about that when a virus comes in contact with the host cell, it is through the spike protein that it attaches to the host cell. So here you can see, I think you can see my pointer here, that is the attachment of the spike protein to the host cell. And what happens? It actually, the virus binds to the cell via the interaction of the S protein of the SARS-CoV-2 via its receptor binding domain. So there is a receptor binding domain and it binds, it actually recognizes the ACE, that is the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor on the host cell and it gets hold to it and attaches, it hooks onto the host cell. Now, what happens next? So if it hooks onto the host cell, what we have learned, we learned that it will actually tear open the S protein to insert the uh, gen genetic material inside the uh, host cell. So when it tears open, then there is another protease which is very important and it plays a very important role in the fusion. And that is this TMPRSS2 that has already been talked about by Rakesh. So here, uh, so I, I, I should not be telling Rakesh, I should be telling Dr. Kundu, but Rakesh is a very uh, sweet junior and he happens to be a very close friend. So I'm preferring it to call Rakesh. So Rakesh has already uh, told you about TMP RSS2, that when this SARS-CoV-2, the different data that has been analyzed by scientists, that when the S protein, it, uh, there is a priming action, which is actually brought about by this protease. And this fusion ultimately results in the release of the viral RNA gen genome inside the host cell cytoplasm. So it's the last step that occurs. So now what happens now when the genome, the RNA has already entered the host cell, what is the last part? It is the virus has to reassemble itself. And there we know that the envelope protein takes a part in uh, actually um, the process of reassembly into the viral structure. And so here we should be very, uh, it's a very interesting to note that ACE, that is the angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor is also functional in case of SARS-CoV. That is not for the COVID-19, but it is also very true that the other SARS uh, infection that were ca uh, caused by other coronaviruses they also use the same receptor on the host cell, that is ACE2. Then what is the exceptionality of uh, SARS-CoV-2? How, it, why it is uh, binding so tightly? Because Rakesh has already told you that it is 10 to 20 times or 10 to 20 folds higher affinity. So what makes it more 
uh, show this affinity towards the host cell. So uh, first of all, we should remember that both SARS-CoV and the SARS-CoV-2 binds to the same human receptor, that is the ACE2. Now, and the scientists have discovered that a bat coronavirus also binds to the ACE2 receptor. But the affinity that the bat ACE2 receptor, a bat shows to the ACE2 receptor, bat coronavirus, uh, it shows a lesser a, a amount of affinity towards the ACE2 receptor. Then how can this virus that is causing this COVID-19 pandemic, how is it that it is showing so much of affinity? Uh, so there is another fact that we have already talked about, the spike protein. I think um, Rakesh has already to told you that about pangolins. So spike protein of pangolins could be an intermediate host uh, between the bats and the humans. And there is another interesting fact that the protein that the coronavirus uses to attach to the human host cell has a compact ridge. And this ridge might, might be, the ridge-like structure might be the responsible cause be behind the more strong affinity of the, this COV-2, SARS-CoV-2, uh, towards the human cells than the other similar viruses that we have been knowing for the past. So the presence of spike protein and the presence of this ridge structure in the spike protein might be the interesting cause behind the greater affinity of the SARS-CoV-2. Now, another interesting fact that the scientists, they have carried out some studies with HeLa cells uh, you might uh, this for the students. It's for the students uh, who know that we can culture the cells and we can uh, transfect the cells with different uh, genetic materials so that uh, they uh, start expressing different um, uh, structures there. And here in the HeLa cells, the scientists have actually, uh, they have done the study that uh, with SARS-CoV-2 virus was able to enter all ACE2 expressing cells. So they were actually uh, culturing HeLa cells where they started expressing ACE2 receptor, not only from human, but from bat, from civet, from pigs, and all the receptors showed the same affinity towards the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So that gives an idea that it is infective to other organisms as well. So it's the ghost story, no take away the G, it's the host story. So we should be talking about the host, means um, what is the uh, reservoir, what is the intermediate host? And talking about it, there is sequence uh, analysis which reveal that um, the reservoir host of viruses uh, might be the Chinese or intermediate horseshoe bats. But interestingly, we have already showed that this uh, the bat uh, coronavirus uh, is having less affinity in comparison to the one that is causing the COVID-19. So how is that this virus, which is causing this pandemic, attained greater infectious or infectiveness or greater affinity? So it might be coming across through another host, and that may be Malayan pangolin. And this Malayan pangolin, it's, um, it has been studied that it shares about 85 to 92% of homology with SARS-CoV-2. Though maybe uh, we can, with time, we can be knowing about other intermediate hosts also. So better before choosing your food or better before playing with some animals which are actually wild animals, we should think twice that it's better not to go very close to the uh, wild animals. And now about transmission. So when we have already known a little bit of about uh, the infection, so our next responsibility is to know about the transmission and to know how to minimize this transmission. So talking about transmission, the facts and fiction, why have I talked as, as 
fiction because um, many a times when we read the newspapers we hear the news when we talk to friends or when we have a whatsapp message then there are so many fictitious messages full of horrible uh, information and so we should be coming across the original information what is right what is wrong we should be knowing it we should be judging it for that reason i am talking about as facts and fiction so talking about it in the aerosol means in the air when there is covid sars covid 2 then it can stay in the aerosol up to 3 hours if and only if there is no ventilation in presence of ventilation the story will differ so in absence of ventilation the median half life is one more a little more than one hour and it can stay uh, viable up to 3 hours and when uh, the sars covid 2 um, is present on a plastic surface or on the stainless steel and uh, then we can see that they survive there up to a time of 72 hours if there is no intervention of sanitization or any other procedures <coughs> done so we should be very cautious, cautious that if any sanitization procedure is on then the, this story will be different it is not going to stay there for 72 hours and about the copper surfaces in the copper surfaces the vi viruses are less stable they can only survive up to 4 hours and in the cardboard boxes uh, that we generally use regularly they can survive up to 24 hours if you don't go for sanitizing the box and then on the so overall it's a it's a story that on the smooth surfaces the viruses are more stable than on the rough surfaces but only if we don't go for sanitization now the last thing is that how should we go for sanitization of the things or how how to kill the virus uh, a, a virus is very stable at 4 degrees so just keeping in fridge will not kill your virus it's better that you can boil or you can just go for ultraviolet treatment or the best thing that we are hearing regularly is the use of soap lipid solvents then ether and ethanol so all these application will actually give you better eradication of the virus and how the soap uh, actually helps you to get rid of the virus the we have already talked about the virus possesses a lipid membrane so it uh, is the Uh, oily lipid molecules which are actually attacked by the soap and when this uh, soap disrupt the um, lipid membrane of the virus the genetic material gets exposed and that is how you can just destroy the virus so now it's another uh, other stories about transmission is the fact uh we often uh, talk about our o number our o number means when a person is infected then how that person or to how many um, of the people around that person there is a chance of transmission so if i am infected how many people do i have a chance to infect so this sars cov2 has a tendency of infective this ro number being 2 to 4 so if i am infected i am able to transmit the disease to 2 to 4 people so for any epidemic to come under control situation to bring it under controlled situation this ro number should be reduced below below 1 so uh, only if it reduces below 1 then only this can be the epidemic can be under control so we should know that the sars cov2 has a ro number of 2 to 4 and what about uh, this incubation period so uh, the incubation period is generally when uh, uh, if i get infected i may start showing or manifesting the symptoms by 4 to 6 days but if i am not manifesting the symptoms uh, from 4 to 6th day it is for sure in 95% of the cases i will be manifesting symptoms by the 14th day 
It's for sure. If I'm infected, I'm going to display the symptoms by 14th day. So um, how is it? How far it is contagious? It means I, if I'm having the disease or if I'm having the infection, why and how I'm going to transmit it or I'm going to uh, be contagious to the people around me. It has been seen that if I am infected and if supposedly from tomorrow I'm going to show the symptoms, then today is a very good day for transmitting the disease. So one day before to the days immediately after manifestation of the symptoms is the good day, is the good period of time when a person is can be uh, actually held responsible for spreading the disease. The person is contagious. So these are the informations and this, so before supposedly I have the infection but still I'm not manifesting it. So uh, but day after tomorrow or tomorrow, I'm going to manifest it. So today, if I transmit the disease to any friend of mine or any family member of mine, then I am a pre-symptomatic. Uh, actually, it's a, a pre-symptomatic transmission. So nowadays, pre-symptomatic transmission, the idea is emerging. Now, talking about uh, transmission, uh, completing about transmission, I will be coming to our responsibilities to resist this transmission. When we know about transmission, we should try to resist or reduce the transmission of the disease. So I think this part as a responsible citizen, we have already talked about so many times, heard about so many times in the television, in the social network sites, in radios, in the different pamphlets that are given that we have to minimize the disease and that by maintaining social distancing, by personal hygiene. So coming on to the facts, it is first the thumb rules is first you have to wash your hands and that is dhote jao, dhote jao, means you have to at least be 20 seconds for washing your hands. Then you have to, while sneezing or coughing in public, you have to uh, actually cover your mouth with the elbow and you should sneeze in the elbow, not in the palm. And then we should not touch our hand, uh, touch our eyes, nose or mouth you should, before touching uh, eyes, mouth or nose, we should be washing our hands again. Then we should maintain a one and a half meter distance between ourselves. And if I'm feeling unwell, I'll prefer to stay back at home just to reduce the chances of transmitting the disease. So it is as a uh, responsible citizen, these are the few things that we need to know and we need to follow. But about, what about zoologists? So as we are in the platform of zoology, we should also think about some long-term uh, plans to reduce similar chances or similar pandemic. So first of all, please stop invading animal habitats. So we already know a very good saying of Bengali, bon nera bone shundor shishura matri krode. So let the wildlife be safe in the wild we should not be invading the biodiversity hotspots. We should not be invading the animal habitats and make, their, make them our own habitat. Because why? First of all, we don't know in the wild how many viruses are there in the wild animals and how if we go and come in contact with those animals, we increase the probability of getting exposed to those viruses. So that is actually where we should stop invading the animal habitats. We should not disrupt the pristine environment because the environment, uh, if we actually uh, change the balance of nature, if we are um, cutting down the forest, if we are reaching to the wild, then the animals will be forced to leave the jungle and come to the uh, more uh, towards the human population. And that will all once again increase the risk. So uh, we do work hard for human economic development. That is very for sure because uh, we are 
going forward in the civilization is going forward, but there are some hidden costs of human economic development that we should be very cautious about. And um, so disease should not be transmitted from the wild to the human. As we all know that this virus is a zoonotic virus, so we should keep a little bit distance from the animals. And next is a very important uh, part where uh, there is a chance of admixture of several animals in the wet market. So we should try to reduce the animal trades in the wet market because it actually increases the chances of um, admixture of so many genome, uh, so many viruses of one animal to get transmitted to another animal. And that is how uh, the risk of our uh, human pandemic increases. And lastly, I must say that uh, there is one emerging discipline, which is um, actually in uh, talk of the town now is a planetary health. So people are looking forward to find what is the link between human and the ecosystem. So we should study and we should know this link very well just to know where to stop just to know how far we can manipulate the ecosystem, how far we can proceed onto the uh, jungle or the wildlife, how far we can disrupt them. So we should know where we need to stop. Now I will just uh, move on to uh, my next slide where I will be talking about solidarity. So our next responsibility as responsible citizens, I think, is to show solidarity. So in this slide, I'm talking about uh, the solidarity that I saw in this part of the world from where I'm talking now. As you all know that I'm from Belgium and I'm now currently uh, relocated to Belgium. And Belgium has suffered a lot from this pandemic. But the interesting fact is that the way uh, the European Union has decided to face this crisis was brilliant. I, I found it uh, especially it was very nice because um, uh, first of all, uh, they uh, actually allocated nearly 15.6 billion euros and it was not for Belgium or not for the European Union only. It was for global assistance. That is this much of uh, budget was sanctioned to help the countries outside European Union. And to see what were the first things that they were taken care of was the how to tackle the immediate needs of uh, the humanitarian and the health care, then to strengthen the health and the water and the sanitation system, and to address the economic and social consequences. Because it ought to be that this pandemic in near future is going to have a severe effect on the socio-economic structure of the world. And there we need to keep a little bit of budget aside to uh, just uh, support this crisis, this economic um, crisis. And here I must say that while talking about it, they were very clear in uh, saying uh, the urgent short-term emergency response. Then they were taking care of the research and health systems and much uh, fund was allocated to the fact that research should be on for uh, uh, knowing the original biology of the virus and also uh, vaccine research is going on. And then it is the mitigating the economic and social impact. I must sh share uh, a few uh, facts that I saw here. I, I found it very interesting that the time when this uh, lockdown was announced, it was on the same uh, time that the government also announced that if you are unable to pay electricity, you are unable to pay for electricity, for water, or for house rent, then you are not uh, forced to go out of the house, your services would not be terminated until you resume your work. Because it is very true that people who earn their daily life, uh, daily living from their daily work, then they are not going to pay that thing. It's very uh, obvious. And that I found that it is a very uh, good sign of solidarity shown by the government or the administration. Now coming to another part that I found was that 
I'll just share these few photographs from the regular life of ours. It was regularly at 8 p.m. in the evening. We used to go out in the balcony just to clap out our hands and whistle and sing just to say thank you, not only to the health workers, but it was a regular, just you can see so many languages. Gracias means thank you. Merci means thank you. So all these thank yous are not only for the health workers, but also for the workers who were baking the bread because we were having our daily supply regularly. So it was a sign of solidarity from the normal population just to encourage them that we are with you. And at the same time, I feel that when I'm going out, uh, yeah, this is the saying that I used to hear in my uh, school days that little deeds of kindness, little words of love can make earth happy like the heaven above, I believe it. Because when we went out to clap our hands um, in the balcony or through the window, it is not only that we are thanking the people, but at the same time, my neighbor knows that I am living there. And if I am, um, if he or she faces any problem, I am there. You can rely on me. Uh, and I can say that you can rely on me. You can tell me if you want something. That is the way we can just show our solidarity to other people. At the same time, I must say that uh, there was very, for the students, uh, this is for the students, uh, that uh, I must say one thing that in the uh, in this part of the world, we used to get uh, in the post boxes some uh, leaflets with phone numbers because uh, for the people uh, of the aged population, they cannot go out. They were not go allowed to go out for uh, having their daily food or daily commodities. So it was the young people who used to just drop their phone numbers in the post boxes and in the by the phone and they would write if you need you just call me and uh, the old people used to just put some money on their doormats and uh, give a list of commodities that they needed and uh, taking that list of commodities and the money the young people who are also going for their own need to the shops they would buy for them also for the old people also and they will just reach the thing on their doorstep so that is how i think that as human being, we do have some responsibilities and we can show that love, at least in this time of crisis, we need it. So now, another very important thing that we should uh, remember is that of mental health. Remember that you have every right to be happy and you have every right to be at mental peace. So it is we, means um, I'll just say that if I am a parent, I, I, I am a mother of two kids, two kids who are growing up, who are very naughty. So being a parent, being a caregiver, I have stress. Do I do have stress? I face it, but how to tackle that stress? I want that we should maintain a regular routine, a family routine, and if my child is conscious and if he or she is asking about what is COVID-19 and why is it so important that we cannot go out for playing, then we should discuss it. We should, in their appropriate language, in the language that they are going to understand, we should discuss with them how far it is harmful, how it is going to get transmitted, what is your duty in this uh, um, time like that, so on and so forth. And we should also support our children. I know that it is very difficult for them to adjust their life with this home learning procedures, this online classes, home learning abilities are very difficult for the kids to understand. So we should try to support them in that aspect. And now if I have an older adult at home, or if I am an older adult, then what are the things that I should be taking care? I should keep regular contact with my loved ones. May it be through telephone, email, or uh, video chatting or anything. An older adult, as an older adult, you can just keep on having regular contact with your loved ones. And do maintain a regular routine, a regular timing of sleeping, eating, a little bit of exercise, and you should know 
where to contact if there is an emergency. So you should know the numbers and you should keep them in your very close proximity so that you can uh, just dial the numbers when you are in trouble. And if you are a person who is suffering from mental condition, if I am a person who is having depression, and if I am prescribed uh, to have a medicine, I should be taking that condition serious and I should be continuing the medicine. I should not discontinue with the mental health medicines. So I should be, uh, and I should also try to keep in touch with people whom I think they care for me. Now, I say that uh, when I am suffering from any distress or agony, because I'm locked out in my house for so many months, it's, it's really been four months. Uh, and then I should talk to my friends, to my neighbors. If I can just shout uh, out loud and sing a song in my balcony, that doesn't matter. People may think that I'm a little bit crazy, but that's okay. We can be crazy, but we can be happy as well. And uh, if a person uh, shares uh, his or her agony with you, just be compassionate and hear that person, listen to that person with compassion. And uh, I will request you all uh, to read books, um, listen to light music, watch good movies, and um, Maybe some you can engage yourself uh, in preparing some crafts. You can try your hand in cooking, gardening, stitching, any sort of hobby. You should be having it and a little bit of exercise regularly. And I'll just request all the young friends there, my uh, the students there, that please spend less time in the social media because sometimes spending the whole day in social media ends up getting a very big stress because that stress arises from peer pressure uh, and that is not very welcome. And uh, maybe um, in different contexts, but uh, I, I'll be coming uh, back to uh, Robi Thakur's word because I'm always there. Uh, so I'll just remember the words that are very well said that uh, so, so we should be uh, thinking of others. We should be thinking of the world. So enjoy the simplicities of life. It's let's celebrate life. Let's, uh, it seems that life is very tough, very, very tough. But still, it is beautiful. I believe that. And now coming to the points, again, back to science, coming to the points that we should remember is that COVID-19 is likely to affect all people. Maybe many countries, it doesn't depend upon the color of your skin, the ethnicity um, from which country you belong. So you should be empathetic with people who have the infection. It's not that uh, you should be treating them in such a way that they start hiding their disease. It's better that we are empathetic to them so that we get to know about their problems, the, about their infections and all. So we should be a little bit kind. And as a children caretaker, I should try to, I will request you all to try to reduce the anxiety of the children because if I am too am anxious, then my child ought to be very anxious. So I should try to keep my cool. And if I keep my calm, keep my cool, then that's going to be very helpful. And then I will say that constantly hearing the news channels, constantly sticking up to the television, it's not re required, constantly seeing the WhatsApp messages, because most of the facts are very bad, very irrational, and they are not facts, they are fiction. So it's better that we don't listen to the rumors, it's better that we know the information, correct information. As uh, health workers, sometimes some health workers are treated very, uh, in a very, uh, what I'll say, ill manner. Uh, since they are going to hospital, we should not be going close to them, but they will feel very hurt. 
So uh, if somebody who is a health worker who is in the audience, I'll just um, request to that person to keep a, a contact with their loved ones, may it be through telephone, through video chat and all, but it is essential to be happy as well. And please do daily, simple daily exercises and because that little bit of activity will take away the boredom from you. So these are the things that we should remember. Uh, and these are the literature and websites that I have consulted while preparing this one. And now I come back to the fact that I believe that it's, it's a dark day, it's a tough time, but the sun will shine. The rays are off, hopes are there. So taking the words from the rock band, the Beatles, here comes the sun. Truly, I believe that sun will shine. Thank you all for being my audience. I love to have questions from you. Well, thank you, Shumeda, for your nice presentation. In this situation, what should be our responsibility? We have nicely said, hope participants, especially students, have enlightened themselves from your speech in spite of your busy schedule. You have managed time for us. So thank you once again. There must have some questions for you after this session. So stay connected with us. Now, yeah, sure. the, question, now the question and answer session will be handled by Professor Nilam Sabina Murmu over the Nilam. Nilam. Is Nilam there? I think due to some uh, personal reason, uh, uh, due to the lack of uh, connectivity, Nilam is unable no, it's to a, uh, join with It's a technical fault. He she called me that he yeah. she was not able to connect. So I okay, I okay. pinged the question okay, to okay. Sravani ma'am. I okay, pinged okay, the okay. Sravani ma'am. I have collected question from the chat box and pinged to the Sravani ma'am. Okay, uh, okay. Can, so what's so, so, yes, 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 in, yes, in my WhatsApp? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, so, so Sravanidhi, before you go to your WhatsApp, I should ask some questions from, because uh, I have also many questions. I have also written some questions from the participants as well as my questions. So okay. my question is uh, asymptomatic patients. So the pathogen is there. The pathogen uh, infects the particular host, but how become it's asymptomatic? This is my question. It's uh, for me or for Rakesh? For anybody. Uh, is Rakesh is actually on mute. I can see that. Rakesh, Rakesh? if you are going to answer, please. Uh, do yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Say some no, of actually, your... this was unmuted by the host only. I make you go, sir. Oh, no <laughs> problem. No, no we problem. are terribly tech okay. savvy. <laughs> Shupriya? Shupriya? Yes. Uh, this is the this is the viral load actually. So if your viral load is less and your body is actually uh, is thriving well, okay, with uh, lots of immune, you, your immune system is working well, then you won't have uh, those symptoms, okay. So the antibodies you produce, your viral load will low. It is those patients. Uh, who got sick actually, those are immunocompromised subjects or they have some uh, some uh, actually state of less uh, number of antibodies or they have maybe they may be uh, the viral load is excessive uh, so lots of reasons are there okay so people are still working on that hmm. Okay, so my next question. Okay, to... I just want to add one thing, Shupriyo, if yes, it's yes, yes, not yes, problem. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, because definitely. I have come across uh, some uh, information recently um, that um, very interesting one. I don't know, means it's yet, uh, it, it's under research and all. But the thing is that uh, people, uh, here it is uh, seen that people who are uh, tested for antibody titer, uh, some of the people, they show very reduced or no antibodies for COVID. So um, you can roughly say that they didn't have any infection. But the interesting part is that if a person shows severe infection, means severe distress, respiratory distress, severe temperature, and that person suffered for 15 days, 
after recovery, after that, when you show the, if you test the titer of antibody, it is undetectable. But a person who had very mild uh, infection, means uh, maybe it's, it's a, just like a common flu and all, when he or she is tested for COVID, after maybe one month or 21 days, uh, abnormally that person is manifesting uh, antibodies for COVID. So they, it is a very tricky one. Is it uh, this, with the same thing that Rakesh was saying that when a person is not showing symptom, uh, that person is fighting more than the person who is showing the symptoms. Maybe for that uh, less symptomatic or nearly asymptomatic uh, patients are uh, having greater amount of antibody titer in the uh, body but exactly. it is yet under research it's it's just uh, a fact that we come across uh, just few days back what so what's very your nice idea, rakesh i just want to know about it no no it's true it's true it's true that the asymptomatic patient has high titer of antibodies and that is the fact that uh, they can uh, thrive well with the covid 19 yeah, yeah yeah that is the thing Perhaps a very nice example of this asymptomatic patient was uh, Typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary. Yeah. 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 Hey, anyway, so uh, we should go for our next question. It is asked by Dr. Umesh Haldar uh, that why development of specific vaccine towards COVID-19 is taking so long? I should go for this question to Sumedha Di because uh, <coughs> the next question is about diabetics. So I have to go to Rakesha. So if okay. you please, Sumedha Di, give the answer I, of this question. I think, uh, the, Dr. Haldar, it is, uh, I, if I'm not wrong, you told Haldar, no? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, Dr. Yes, Haldar, Haldar, Haldar. I, I will just say that development of any vaccine actually takes nearly one and a half year uh, from uh, research to trial, I uh, mean, from clinical trial, it re really takes long. It's an, a normal course. It's not that it is, uh, this particular vaccine is taking long. It's not that all the vaccine developments, uh, the procedure is itself a long procedure. And we are expecting to have the vaccine very soon. It's not possible. So it's going to take long if the proper clinical <coughs> trial is done. But somehow or other, clinical trials are on in the UK. And um, maybe we are going to see good days. Uh, but you never know. It's influenza, just like influenza virus. Uh, how long it is going to be showing the outer surface same? I don't know if they change the, if it wears a facade, if it starts wearing a mask, the virus starts wearing a mask, then it, it's going to be very difficult for us also. I think <laughs> that's a <the> story. <laughs> okay. I, uh, it is very nice uh, to hear you that virus wearing a mask. Uh, actually, that happened. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, another question by Ong Shuman Rai. Uh, perhaps this is a question of uh, diabetic patients, so I should go to uh, Dr. Kundu. Uh, if you please answer this question that why the coronavirus acts as an opportunistic infection in case of diabetic patients. Okay, so uh, are you uh, are you aware of diabetes, diabetes types, and uh, what are the consequences of type one, type two? Okay, okay. If you see the diabetic, the diabetic patient, uh, you you see actually even a mask. Okay, so lots of cytokines. So it's a chronic disease, not a one day or two or like that or one year. It's a chronic disease. Once a, get, a person gets sick, a he ought to seek uh, for uh, for his life. Okay, once he, he is in diabetic condition, so there is a already uh, you are in the advanced stage. If a person is a is in diabetic condition, so he is already in advanced stage, even a compromised stage. Okay, so the virus is take this opportunity to to actually. Um, actually prove fatal or prove a very severe infection for those who are having diabetes because of uh, this immunocompromised state. Okay. Okay. Huh. So, yes. So, uh, thank you, Rakesh. <coughs> so, now my next question is from 
Megha. Megha Kobiraj, perhaps uh, she was a student. Uh, another another thing, another yes, thing, yes, Supriyo. Okay. Supriyo. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. It, it should be. It should be. Sorry, known. I thought that he was stop. Ah, I'll stop. I'll stop. I'll stop. I'm, okay, I'm actually, okay, okay, okay. I, I want to add further okay. that uh, high level of glucose means uh, we always see in diabetes there is certain passion. And that that should be controlled by so many drugs. Okay. In a hyperglycemic condition, what the glucose actually acts as insulin. Okay. So when you have a high level of glucose in your immune system uh, remains suppressed. Okay. <clears throat> okay so you okay, are not yes. truly responding 100 percent to the COVID-19 or any kind of illness. Okay. Okay. So uh, my next question to uh, Dr. Sumedha Roy, uh, uh, actually this question is asked by our students as your students also, this is Megha Kobiraj, she has asked that the RO number remain the same for asymptomatic carrier person, is this true? The RO number remain yeah, the no, same no, can, from uh, asymptomatic... I can understand, but I uh, am not aware of the... RO number for asymptomatic. I'm not, maybe I need to uh, see and confirm that uh, in the chat uh, later on. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Means it's better to say that I don't know about the RO number in asymptomatic because um, the asymptomatic transmission is a very uh, a thing which is now being uh, analyzed very critically. But uh, previously, it was um, the transmission rate is automatically high when a person coughs or sneezes. It's through the aerosol. So the transmission rate is more or less more and apparent when uh, the patient is manifesting the symptoms. That is very clear. And there, the RO number is two to four. But I am not aware about the asymptomatic transmission so well. So maybe later on, or uh, anybody, if Rakesh knows it, I can just ask. No, no, no I'm not an expert of that. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> perhaps, sorry, perhaps, our, perhaps our okay. another another uh, co-host, Neelam, madam, has joined. Neelam, uh, are you audible? Ne Neelam, hello. Okay, so Sabuni, do you, do you have any questions? Yes, Sabuni, yes. one question. Actually, there are okay. some repeated questions, but one question for uh, Rakesh sir. That is, question is from hmm. Piyali Chakraborty, Khadra College. Hmm. Do vitamin C and vitamin D levels in human body affect risks for coronavirus? I actually don't know, but reports actually suggest that okay. uh, there is a... Uh, uh, actually, vitamin C is an immune booster. So if you take on, keep on uh, taking some fruits with vitamin C, so they might be having some advantageous effect on the patients or healthy subjects. Also. Okay. Okay. So, A very interesting that, question has been uh, forwarded by Koshik Ghosh. Yes. If I'm not wrong, Koshik Da. Um, uh, it's a, it's a very interesting one. Why bats are not expressing the symptoms? Uh, yeah. Why bats are not expressing the symptoms? It's for um, answer. Do you need uh, want to answer it, um, uh, Rakesh? No, I don't know. But uh, I can add a few things with that. That the the spike protein of uh, that <clears throat> coronavirus actually uh, is more vividly binds to the receptor, the C2 receptor, of the human host, and it has been hypothesized that uh, it is the microenvironment of the the spike proteins of pangolin, bat, humans, I saw such that the C2 receptor for uh, human, bat, pangolins, and other animals are almost same in structure, okay? So it is not the structure only that is responsible for binding and infectivity. So it is the microenvironment which actually affects that uh, binding and infectivity, okay? It is, uh, or some other binding mechanism may exist, which we don't know, but uh, COVID-19 is uh, much better, uh, shows much better infectivity in case of human host. 
but why it is not showing any kind of uh, uh, symptoms in back or is it is there any report that it is not showing any symptom in back i don't come across any report <clears throat> but any kind of any kind of disease uh, any kind of virus which are originated in back may require some intermediate host uh, because in the current covid 19 cases it is the that wholesale market uh, in the wholesale market the pangolins are also sold the bats are obviously also sold but uh, it is it is there uh, in the literature that uh, actually human human actually get this infection through the intermediate host not directly from bats yeah bats might not be uh, manifesting the uh, symptoms may it be because uh, i don't know whether they don't manifest it at all or not because uh, the ace2 receptors that are also present in bat they bind to this uh, sars cov2 uh, virus but they bind it poorly bind to them poorly it's not <coughs> that efficacy as that of the human uh, ace2 receptor and that too what uh, rakesh i'll uh, second the thing that uh, we have this uh, spike and this protease activity which actually uh, and the ridge uh, protein which actually uh, increases the efficacy of binding uh, of this virus to the uh, human cells and that too in the alveolar cells uh, and uh, the the micro environment of the alveolar cells and the upper respiratory tract cells they actually cause the accumulation of interferons and this immune uh, uh, reactions that causes the disease that is the manifestation of the disease <clears throat> so that is how i think it is uh, responsible in case of uh, human but uh, i can add one thing that uh, i can add one thing that uh, these receptors also uh, show or expressed in pancreatic beta cells yeah, yeah. in kidney cells uh, in liver cells and uh, in other cell types these receptors are expressed but it is not hugely the study is not hugely conducted in other cell types but in beta cell i can i can say that these uh, these receptors may help the virus to bind to to get uh, and therefore the beta cells actually got damaged due to this virus maybe this is a kind of hypothesis and uh, due to this the covid 19 patients whatever uh, which were healthy or diabetic uh, whatever be uh, they are actually this shows a kind of high uh, high level of glucose in their circulation so it is believed that maybe the beta cells which are expressing the ace2 ace receptor and the virus also can uh, can invade the beta cells also damage them in huge number so that a kind of upsurge of glucose is there in the in the circulation but this is uh, under <clears throat> postulation okay okay i just want to add one thing uh, since you were talking about uh, beta cells uh, i i'm also interested to add few things on uh, since i'm working on neurological disorders now more into the neurodegenerative ones so i came to know that um, when the viral titer goes means the, the after uh, the uh, in disease is getting more and more worse in a patient it uh, uh, actually starts multi organ problems but before that initially when the uh, first response is on the respiratory tract so maybe the question to koshi uh, the answer to Kosh koshik das question is that maybe the alveolar cells are getting uh, bind uh, this binding affinity is more strong in the alveolar cells but it's not that the other cells the pancreatic ones also when they are have been studied but that is after a course of uh, infection it has already infection. started the infection after that that manifestation in other tissues are becoming prominent but it is more prominent in the upper respiratory tract initially so it has also been seen that when the disease is far out of control means when it becomes fatal just before that and in the post mortem brains as well uh, it has been the lesions there are uh, people show convulsion uh, before death also it has been seen so there some neurological problems are also um, uh, gearing up uh, when the, the infection is out of control when it is already attained a uh, 
peak. <clears throat> Maybe that all the tissues, it's a multi-organ uh, failure at that time. The multi-organ failure is because of uh, the blood clotting factor, okay? yeah. blood coagulation. So coagulation is a kind of uh, uh, event which has been noticed or noted in case of COVID-19 infection. So this coagulation actually leads to multi-organ failure. Multi-organ damage. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Perhaps this is not my question. This is the question of the people of the whole world. That yes, uh, Sumedha ma'am, you told that uh, within a very short time we will see the sun rays of hope. But how short it is, how long it will take to that we all, everything will be as like previous. We have to go colleges and uh, everything will be I will fine. Just, I will just say one thing. I have started going to the university for two last two weeks. So I think... Um, it's not it's not going to be very difficult for you also after a certain time because uh, we were also locked down in the Europe the conditions were not good but we were locked down and um, uh, from March and uh, we were working from home but now we have started going uh, to the lab and to the university so hopefully everything gets well so that's the best thing that we can do is to hope and nothing more than that. And really, th patient. thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Sumedadi and Rakeshda. But I should be thankful to Sumedadi once again that oh. in Bengali literature we used to uh, use this word. Many questions are there that Nam Koroner Shatthokata. Perhaps with your this hope, last hope that you have started your university going very short time, you will also go to college. And perhaps the name of this uh, webinar is also too true that hopes and responsibilities. Okay, yeah, so anyway, now we will move to our IQSC coordinator. There are many questions actually, but uh, due to sh um, short of time, I actually- can, I can add uh, one thing. Yes, yes. I yes. can add one thing, okay. Okay, I, I was watching an interview by Vijay Raghavan, which is, who is the actually the chairman of DBT and DST, SCRB. So he is telling that uh, it will take another eight months in India. Uh, and for DBT to to generate the vaccine, okay, it is the so we'll uh, have to wait for eight months more. Hopefully. Means uh, by December and January, I think. But I in comparison to life, eight months is a very short time. Right? <laughs> a very short time, obviously. Very short time. <laughs> obviously, by that and, time we have to <laughs> do some conservative. Really, I also want to add one thing, and in comparison to that, it's very difficult to uh, generally it shouldn't do, but we have to. It's a difference between national and international. Two, that you, you must have started and still we are staying at home. That no, I, we don't know actually that when we have to go to colleges. Anyway, so uh, we should go to our IQSC coordinator, Dr. Shamal said. Uh, he is working for a long time. And sir, I request you to please uh, go to the vote of thanks. Sir, Samuel, Dr. Samuel said, please. You are muted. You are muted. Unmute yourself. Unmute, sir. Dr. Unmute Samuel yourself. said you are muted. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yes. Hearty, hearty good afternoon to all the participants present in this distinguished and intellectually virtual gathering. It is my privilege and honor to be the one making the vote of thanks on this session as a coordinator of IQAC and on behalf of my prestigious institution, Ascensor Girls College, I express my sense of gratitude to the honorable speaker, Dr. Rajesh Rakesh Kundu, Bishop Bharati, Department of Geology, and Dr. Sumedha Roy, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, Gent University, Belgium, who took out their valuable time from their busy schedule and blessed us with their lecture and the title of Corona Pandemic Searching Hope and Responsibility. I would like to thank our distinguished speaker for making such excellent presentation and making this webinar, that is webinar, interesting and meaningful. 
the question answer session was filled with enthusiasm and vigor. Heartiest thank our vice principal, entire team of AGC, with special mention the faculty members of biology department, uh, organizing members, meeting coordinators who have worked hard for organizing this webinar. Lastly, I am happy to express vote of thanks and congratulate to our college teaching staff for more than 600 registered participants, students, for their active participation who have made this webinar and grand success. Big thanks to all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sumita, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you Rajesh Kondu, sir. Thank you. Biru, I just now want I to add one thing. Biru, 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 I, I, I just want to add one thing that may, there are many questions in the comment box, but due to lack of time, we are unable. So please, Sumedha Madam and Rakesh Kundu, uh, if we give your mail ID to all the participants, it, it will be there in the Asamsal Girls College uh, website. Okay, the email ID of Sumedha Madam and Rakesh Kundu will be given in the Asamsal College website, Asamsal Girls College website. So all the participants, those questions, we are unable to uh, uh, question actually to the speakers. So please go through their emails. Thank you, Biru. No, please. Thank you. I will. I will be happy.